My name is Irving Berkner. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for International Studies, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to another World Beyond the Headlines event. This program is uh, co-sponsored by my Center of International Studies, the International House, the Seminary Co-op Bookstore, and the Chicago Council on uh, Global Affairs. Uh, tonight's event is being audio and video recorded uh, for broadcast on the web. Uh, you'll be able to hear this program and all the programs we've done as part of this series uh, by going online to our site, uh, which is kiosmos.uchicago.edu, or um, Chicago Public Radio's Chicago Amplified, which is at chicagopublicradio.org slash amplified. And if you can't remember all that, there's uh, flyers back on the, the book table uh, for your convenience. So um, all those files can be downloaded. Uh, they're, they're pretty popular, uh, and they're, they're free, which is even better. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn things over to Paul Barrett to start tonight's event. And what we're going to do tonight is basically talk to each other about our respective books. Let me start by uh, introducing Dr. Abdallah and, and his book. Uh, he's the author of a fascinating book, A Muslim in Victorian America, The Life of Alexander Russell Webb. Dr. Abdallah is the chair and scholar in residence at the Nawawi Foundation, a nonprofit educational foundation here in Chicago. Uh, he uh, received a Ph.D. in Arabic and Islamic studies from the University of Chicago in 1978. And uh, I'll say from my own observation and interaction with uh, Muslims all around the country uh, that he's very well known in American Muslim circles for his wise and judicious teaching about Islam in an American context. Thank you. His book is about a, uh, a really extraordinary figure in American history and in Islamic history, Alexander Russell Webb, who's depicted on the cover in this beautiful photograph. Webb was uh, from the Hudson Valley in New York. He was a journalist, a civil servant, and a diplomat. He was raised Presbyterian, but had considerable curiosity about other religions, especially Islam. While serving as U.S. Counsel to the Philippines in 1888, he embraced Islam personally, one of the first Americans to convert um, in this fashion. Soon after, he began corresponding with uh, important Muslims in India and became an enthusiastic propagator of the faith in this country. Uh, he wrote books on Islam, gave lectures on the subject, and even published a journal called The Muslim World. He served as uh, the representative of the religion of Islam uh, at the 1893 World's Parliament of Religions here in Chicago. And in 1901, he was uh, appointed the Honorary Turkish Council General uh, in New York. And as we'll discuss in more detail when I uh, ask Umar about, uh, in more detail about the book, uh, some of the themes in Webb's life uh, about how to combine uh, Islamic ideas and Islamic faith with uh, American life and, and American attitudes really uh, continue to echo you know, more than 100 years after his life. Uh, so it, it's a book that I read and enjoyed, thoroughly learned a tremendous amount from, and I would recommend it to anybody who came here tonight for sure. Uh, so now I'll introduce uh, my friend Paul Barrett. Um, Paul. Uh, studied at the University of Harvard. He studied uh, history, American history, in college, and then he also studied in the Harvard Law School. Uh, for 18 years, he worked as an editor, a front page editor and uh, writer for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the book that he's written, uh, the struggle, uh, American Islam, The Struggle for the Soul of a Religion, um, is a book that actually began with uh, the work that he did for a number of front page uh, articles that were written for the Wall Street Journal. Um, Paul also wrote another book, um, which is called The Good Black, A True Story of Race in America. Uh, this is a story about an African American who graduated, um, I believe, also from Harvard Law School, who was a lawyer, and it examines the racial relationships in corporate America. Um, Paul now works for Business Week, and he is um, he directs the investigative uh, reporting team of the journal, and he lives in New York City. Um, this book, American Islam: The Struggle for the Soul of a Religion, um, is a book that's uh, very interesting to read. It's very easy to read. I find myself that. 
one of the most difficult things to do in speaking to Americans about Islam and the American Muslim community is to communicate because of the fact that so many Americans know very little about Islam, Islamic history in the Muslim world. Stories are perhaps more effective in communicating and changing opinions than anything else. Um, this book is a collection of a number of stories and those stories are all taken from years of Paul's investigating the American Muslim community. Uh, he focuses on seven people, uh, the imam, the activist, the webmaster, the scholar, the publisher, the feminist, and the mystics. Um, each of these stories is very interesting. Um, each of these persons represents a particular dimension of the American Muslim community. And in each story, uh, you also have a number of other persons that uh, are part of the narrative that are usually related to, uh, in some way connected to the person that is discussed. Uh, the book begins with um, a very useful introduction about the American Muslim community, uh, its size, um, the level of education in it, which is quite high. Uh, Paul points out that about 59% of the American Muslim community uh, has college degrees, whereas 27% of the American population in general uh, have college degrees. Um, he also points out that the American Muslim community per capita is one of the most wealthy in the world. Average income is between $50,000 a year and 60000 So I think the American Muslim community is a very interesting crucible in which to look at this story, uh, the struggle for the soul of religion. Of course, he concludes also with uh, ideas about where Islam um, will go in the United States, what the, where the struggle may ultimately lead. Uh, with that, I guess we can open up the discussion right. um, about the book, books. Um. So let's go in, in, in historical chronology, and since uh, Mr. Webb comes long before anybody I, I write about, let's start with him. As a, a, uh, a fan of American history and uh, once a uh, medium diligent uh, American history student in college, uh, I found Webb to be a fascinating character uh, exemplifying uh, the uncertainty, as you were discussing uh, before, before we started, the uncertainty of the post-Civil War era, mm -hmm. the fascination with spiritualism ac across the board in this country in that era. But uh, why don't you start by telling us a little bit more about why Webb should be of interest to readers today, be beyond just purely as a historical figure? Mm -hmm. Webb is um, a person of amazing stature. Uh, conversion to Islam in the 20th century is not unusual. Conversion in the 19th century was. But what I find especially interesting about Webb is that um, this is a man uh, who was known in the country. Um, as Paul pointed out, uh, he was connected to um, many prominent Americans. He was a counsel. He could go to the White House. Uh, he knew American ambassadors and councils. He was connected to journalists. Um, in fact, uh, he apparently knew Mark Twain. Mark Twain was one of the first people that he invited to the parlor talks that he had about Islam in 1892 when he came back to New York, uh, in early 1893 when he came back to New York from India. In fact, uh, Mark Twain in Tom Sawyer Abroad which is a book that he published in 1894, not to be confused with Tom Sawyer. Uh, Twain has a piece of humor which is actually very well known in the United States about Missouri Muslims. And for Twain, Webb would have been a Missouri Muslim because his journalistic life was in Missouri. And uh, Tom and Huck and Jim take a hot air balloon and they go uh, across the Atlantic by mistake and they come to Africa and when they come to Egypt they come down into Cairo and they walk around and they go into a big mosque which Huck thinks is a church 
And he says it was so big that the church in Hannibal would have looked like a box of dry goods in it. And then they see whirling dervishes in the mosque. And um, Tom says to Huck, they're all Muslims. And Huck says, well, what's a Muslim? And Tom replies, uh, it's a person who's not a Presbyterian. <laughs> and then Huck says, then there's lots of them back in Missouri. I didn't know that before. And I believe that that's probably connected to Webb's story because Webb's story was notorious. It was all over the American press. Uh, when Webb came back to New York City in February of 1893, he tried to avoid the press and the New York Times immediately discovered him. Most of the story about Webb is taken from the New York Times that, continue, that, that frequently ran stories about him. So I think the prominence of, of Webb is important. Um, an American Muslim named Florence Ives Osman, who wrote about Webb in the 1940s, described him as an undiscovered monument that needs to be uncovered. And uh, I actually you know, found him to be that. When I began to look into him, um, you know, I found that there's a lot there. And he's a very interesting figure. And I think also he is an American who regarded himself to be very American. And he regarded his conversion to be completely consistent with his identity as an American. And he believed that Islam would fit in not only uh, in a harmonious way with American identity, but in fact, in a very positive way. What was it about Islam that he thought uh, mel melded well with, with uh, his uh, term you use, his Americanness? Um, Webb believed that Islam was very rational. Uh, he believed that it was a religion of uh, universal brotherhood. Um, he believed that it was compatible with science. And um, he believed that Islam would enable America to be what America wanted to be. Um, he doesn't go into great detail about that, but Webb was a Victorian liberal, um, and he did believe in um, brotherhood, like Victorians, what, like Victorian whites in general. Um, he does have an element of racism. I go into that in the book. It's one of the contradictions in his character. But at the same time, he believed in interracial marriage. He was against uh, the lynching of blacks and the ab abuse of blacks in the South. Uh, he believed in gender equality. So he has a number of really interesting positions. And I think to um, explain that further, Webb uh, believed that uh, Islam was a very powerful moral force. Uh, as a Victorian, uh, he was morally conservative, and as a liberal, he was socially liberal. So Webb was very much concerned about the slums of Chicago, of New York, and he was concerned, like a lot of Victorians, with things like drunkenness and uh, you know the uh, what he regarded as the decay of the city. Uh, the great discrepancy between the rich and the poor, uh, he believed, and a lot of other Americans believed, that Islam could be a positive force there. He was um, attracted to mysticism, the Sufi aspect of Islam. He believed that all religions have an esoteric and exoteric dimension. He was affected by theosophy. Uh, he uh, held very highly in esteem the works of Madame Blavatsky, uh, and he believed that the esoteric and the exoteric in Islam go very nicely together, but he felt that Islam would be, in its exoteric form, its moral form, very valuable uh, for America. Um, what's interesting to me is that his reception in America was remarkably good. And um, a lot of Americans felt that uh, what he said made sense and that he should be given a chance to teach what he believed in, um, and to see if it worked. What was his vision, essentially pluralistic? Did, did he see mm -hmm. Islam fitting in alongside other faiths and mm -hmm. fitting in alongside a, uh, a secular political system? Uh, Webb was very pluralistic, and um, he believed in the 
overriding unity of faiths. Um, that can be indexed by his attachment to the theosophical movement. That's maybe, one of the, maybe you should stop and say what the theosophical mo movement is. Yeah, the theosophical movement of uh, Madame Blavatsky and uh, a number of others. Webb knew them. Uh, Madame Blavatsky, who was from Russia uh, and came to the United States, uh, he did not know. I think, uh, as I recall, she passed away um, before the Theosophical Society was established in the United States. Um, but Webb knew Olcott and he knew other prominent members of the Theosophical Society, and they knew him and they wrote about him. When he went to India, he even met with them. The Theosophical Society uh, was a society that um, was interested in spreading the knowledge of Hinduism and Buddhism and other faiths in America, and it taught that there's an underlying unity in them all. Um, and it was, in fact, theosophy that probably more than anything else actually brought Webb to the Islamic religion. First, he was a Buddhist, and then he became a Muslim uh, later on. What about some basic, basic facts? How many other Muslims would there have been in the United States in the, in the late 1800s, and where were they from, and, and what sorts of uh, approaches did they have as compared to, uh, to Webb's perspective? Um, at that time, the um, Muslims in the United States would have been overwhelmingly immigrants. Um, Muslim immigration to the United States begins around 1875, coming primarily from greater Syria, which is Syria and Lebanon. Uh, most of the early immigrants who came over were uneducated. They worked on the railways like the Chinese. They worked in factories. They worked in mines. Um, and as peddlers in the, in the They Midwest. worked as peddlers. The word Arab along the eastern coast uh, meant peddler. And we had Arabs here in Chicago on 22nd Street between the black community and between the red light district. And they were peddlers, so they could go. Um, they, could, they didn't have to know English very well. They could uh, you know, sell goods, but especially in the black community. So um, you know, one of the interesting things in American Muslim history is the fact that the early immigrants uh, tended to interface with the black community. Uh, whereas the later immigrants that come after 1965, in the wake of the amendment of the uh, Immigration Act, they tend to be highly educated, physicians and engineers, and they go to the suburbs. And that has a huge effect on the way that Islam develops. So Webb is a convert, and in that he represents a very small percentage. Uh, there were other converts around him, but Webb, like American Buddhists and American Hindus at the time, uh, emphasized not just conversion, but also sympathy. So he reached out for sympathizers. And I think one of the things interesting about Webb is the fact that um, perhaps given his political background, he was a politician, he always remained a politician. Um, he sought alliances, uh, another aspect of his pluralism. And so therefore, everyone in American society whom he felt would support his cause, um, he allied with. And uh, he supported their journals. They supported his. Um, now, Webb saw himself as attempting to, to spread his newly adopted faith in, in the United States. How is the um, Muslim conception of propagating the faith or proselytizing similar to or different from um, what we know about uh, the Christian approaches uh, mm -hmm. to that activity? Well, when Webb was asked that question, do you intend to spread Islam in the United States, uh, his answer was invariably no. Um, and that seems to be honest in the sense that Webb saw himself as an initial stage. And that stage was one of education. So he wanted to make Islam known. Uh, he wanted to you know, to, to speak and uh, to write. He had a very interesting newspaper. He had also a sort of pamphlet-like uh, newsletter that he sent out. Um, but Webb felt that the first thing was to get Americans to know what Islam was and to examine it. And he used to say that I believe very deeply 
in the fair-mindedness of the American people. And I feel that if they know what Islam really is, that they uh, will like it. That they will, not that they will necessarily become Muslims, but that they will respect it. Uh, again, um, you know, Webb is a person with a very definite class consciousness. So he focused on what he called the educated classes, those who are trained to think. And um, other people that lived around him um, you know, that were not educated, usually he, wouldn't, he didn't bother to speak about Islam with them, even though they would know that he had a very strange religion. And they would know that he was a Muslim. He never concealed that. Um, to a answer your question, uh, Islam, Christianity, and Buddhism are all uh, proselytizing faiths. Um, throughout history, Islam, it, it proselytizes in different ways. Um, probably one of the most effective is through business. Uh, it was the Muslim trader that was perhaps more than any other um, the great proselytizer, but I believe that it's correct to say that the uh, mechanism in that was direct personal relations. And in the United States, if you look at converts, most of whom are African Americans, who make up the overwhelming convert community, um, well over 90% of those who convert, convert because of a direct personal contact. And I believe that throughout Islamic history, that was probably the rule, whether that contact came from a merchant or from a Sufi or from someone else. And studies of the conversion of Islam show very clearly that it was not spread by the sword. That um, is something that is very anomalous whenever it occurs. In most Muslim countries, especially those core countries like Egypt, Syria, Iraq, Iran, uh, Muslim Spain, uh, the process of the spread of Islam, as Richard Bullitt at Columbia University has shown in some really excellent studies, uh, and by the way, has a book called The Case for an Islamo-Christian Civilization that came out re recently, Columbia University Press, which is a really good book, a really useful book. And he talks about this a little bit in that book. But usually those countries develop Muslim-majority populations over a period of 200 to 300 years. In fact, when the Crusaders came to the Levant, uh, to, in, in the Crusades, to Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, northern Egypt, Iraq, um, the majority populations in many of those countries, uh, like Lebanon, was still overwhelmingly Christian. Uh, the Crusaders were not necessarily any more merciful with them than they were with Jews or Muslims. So to uh, sum up, what would you say is the legacy of uh, Webb to today? What, what does he tell us about uh, Islam in America today? What, uh, what lessons do we ultimately take from his um, really singular experience? I, mean, I don't think it's probably not another person you would say is much like your, uh, your subject. I believe that uh, you know, the question of legacy is one of the questions that is raised in the book, and it's something that um, books written about Islam in America, and there is now a very significant literature about Islam in America, and this book by Paul Barrett, American Islam, is uh, definitely a contribution to that. Just I'd like to say that again because of the fact that it is not easy to get people to understand something that lies outside their cognitive frames. And the story is the best way to do that. So I think a lot of the academic studies that have been done to this time, um, they probably won't have the kind of effect that a book like this will have. Um, but that being said, um, what was your question? <laughs> well, we want a punchline, we want a bottom line here. What, what can we take away as the yeah, legacy okay. of, of yeah. Mr. Webb? I lost my chain of thought. Not at all, but um, you went off in a good direction, so that's, uh, yeah, that's I did. quite all right. Um, I think that as Florence Ives Osmond said in the 1940s, uh, this man is a monument to time. And he shows that Islam has been in the West, 
Uh, he shows that people of note uh, find it rational and convincing. Um, and I think that uh, he's an important part of our identity as American Muslims because of the fact that part of belonging to a society is the uh, sense of being rooted. And um, the study of Islam in America in the last uh, two decades has in fact focused on that aspect that Islam does have roots in the Americas. It has roots in, uh, especially in slavery. Um, a lot of the Africans that were enslaved in West Africa and came here uh, to the Americas in general, Brazil got 42%, um, were Muslims, 10% to 15%. And Paul Barrett also mentions that in his book, as I do in mine. So the sense of being rooted, uh, immigrants, for example, the first known immigrant to the United States came from Syria, and uh, he came in 1856, brought by Jefferson Davis, Secretary of War, and uh, under Franklin Pierce, the president, and uh, his name was High Jolly. High Jolly, he's buried in Quartzsite, Arizona. It's a big thing out there. Uh, you can visit his grave. It's, you know, one of the, uh, it's on the travel brochures of Arizona, which maybe says something about Arizona, but, and what they have to offer to tourists, but High Jolly, his name was actually Hajj Ali, Hajj Ali and Americans called him High Jolly. He was brought over to be in charge of uh, the Camel Corps, which Jefferson Davis thought would be the perfect way to take care of the newly acquired territories in the Great Southwest. So that's an interesting history. And in fact, we have folk, folk songs about High Jolly that, um, you know, I think it says he didn't mind the burning sands, but uh, he didn't mind the 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 beautiful girls the best, and something like that. So um, I think the fact that Webb is an American Muslim is very significant for identity. And also, um, the amazing part of the story, in my opinion, is the fact that Webb was remarkably in the middle of it all. That when you tell his story, you're talking about a person who went to the same church as Martin Van Buren. Uh, who adopts Van Buren politics, free soil politics throughout his life. You're talking about a person that would have known Samuel Tilden. And in 1876, Webb supported Tilden, who was a Democrat who won the popular vote and lost the election. You remember that, right? And that's because the Republicans stuffed the ballot box in Florida and in three other states. I mean, amazing uh, you know, coincidence. But he knew Tilden. Tilden is also from his county. Um, the Hudson River School is based there. Um, you know, so this is a person who, when you tell his life story, you really tell a very important part of American history. And for me, quite frankly, um, I wrote the book trying to make it, it is academic, um, don't look at the footnotes, don't be frightened, they're on the back of the book, but you know, don't look at how many there are. And I really tried as hard as I could to get it at an eighth grade level um, so that it's easy to read. And I hope interesting to read because I want people to read it, but I especially want the American Muslim community to read it because of the fact, and I mean by that, and I mean by African Americans as well, as uh, the recent immigrants and their children because of the fact that this tells a lot of the story of African Americans. This is a civil war. Uh, this tells us about the Fugitive Slave Act, uh, Frederick Douglass. Webb is also, he crosses tracks with Frederick Douglass, Ida Wells, Susan B. Anthony, an amazing story. But uh, at the same time, um, you know, uh, you, you get this picture of how American culture develops. The Victorian period is an extremely interesting period. Our stereotypes of it are generally false. And I think that for our community, it's important to understand not just Webb, but how American culture develops so that we become um, creators of that culture. 
not just consumers of it. And you can't be a creator of culture if you don't understand it. Uh, the Arabs say um, that you know, people are the enemies of what they don't know. And by the same token, when you begin to know something, the enmity either ceases to be or it certainly decreases. And so th this was actually one of my primary objectives, to help to give our community something that they can attach to, which increases their positive identity uh, in this society. Well, I'm sure you will succeed in that. And as someone not in your community, I certainly learned a tremendous amount uh, just as an interested outsider. Thank you very much. Um, now I get to ask my questions. And um, first of all, I'd like to say that um, you know the struggle for the soul of a religion. Um, we are talking here, Paul, aren't we, about uh, the struggle for the soul of Islam in the American Muslim community? Yes. Um, there, there's been a tremendous amount written and much debated um, about a uh, so-called clash of civilizations, meaning clash between East and West, between Islam and Christianity, perhaps. And uh, while I think that's a subject worthy of study and worthy of contemplation, it, it's actually not my subject, primarily. Mm -hmm. The struggle that I refer to in the um, subtitle of the book is really uh, the, the series of conflicts and tension and flux among American Muslims as they sort out what it means to be both Muslim and, and, and American. And that points to uh, the, the huge variety within the religion in this country. There, there are very few mm -hmm. places in the world where Islam is as varied as it is here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is really, in my experience, the, the opposite of monolithic. Muslims do not have one set Islamic view mm -hmm. on anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the foundational points in the book. I mean, that's why the, the cover of the book, at the simplest level, rather than showing an image of a mosque or some image of the religion as a whole, instead right. is, an, is a series of images of individual people who are from very different parts of the world and different parts of this country. Mm -hmm. um, and as you read the book, you, you, you see them at times in quite heated conflict with one another. The point is, my point is not that Muslims are in conflict all the time, but that by, by studying conflicts, you can frequently see the essence of things. And you can see what, what issues are really important to people. Good. Um, now, in this book, we have, um, you know, right here, the Imam. This is uh, Imam Siraj Wahaj uh, from New York City, Brooklyn, a uh, very significant person. Uh, we have then the activist, who is um, Mustafa Saeed, um, who studied in Tennessee and then went to Florida. We have here the webmaster, who's actually a Saudi, who studied in the University of Idaho. Right. And then we have here the scholar who is Khalid Abu al-Fadl, who teaches at UCLA. Uh, we have here the publisher who, for me, is the most interesting of all the stories. Uh, he's from Dearborn. Um, he's a very noted um, publisher. And his name is Osama, name you've heard before. And his last name is Sibilani. Uh, then we have the feminist who is um, Asra uh, Nomani. And then we have the mystics, uh, who are two Americans. Um, and uh, they are closely, what are, what are their names? Victor? Their names are Abdul Kabir and Rachma Krambo. OK. And uh, these are uh, two persons associated with Hisham Kabani, who is an important Sufi sheikh uh, in this country. Um, now, I'd like to ask you um, how you chose these seven people uh, for your work. Right. Like a, a lot of um, journalism between hard covers, unlike, say, scholarship between hard covers, scholarship is frequently planned out and plotted out and is the culmination of, of articles that, that grow over time and papers that are presented at, at, uh, at symposia and so forth. A lot of journalism comes together very ser serendipitously. Um, after 9-11, uh, I wrote a series of articles for the Wall Street Journal, as you said, 
about several of these people, much narrower than what the book is. And after writing several of these pieces, a friend of mine, it was, it was no more planned out than this, said, you know what, I think you have the makings of a book proposal. And I said, huh, maybe I do. And at that point, I began to, to ask myself, so what would be the common themes? And that's how it came together, very inductively. Uh, and I went out and found a few more people to profile so that I would present the reader not with a uh, sociologically uh, uh, perfectly representative cast of characters, but instead a group of people who are suggestive of the variety and whose experiences, while not necessarily typical, because all of these people in one way or another actually are somewhat unusual. They are un this is an unusually talented group. This is an unusually ambitious group. These are people who speak pu publicly or have gotten involved in interesting confrontations with other people. Um, and I, I chose them, as I say, not because each one of them is typical, but because the issues that, surround, that swirl around them, I thought, were worthy of attention mm -hmm. and were issues that, in fact, did affect a much wider uh, array of uh, Muslims in this country. Thank you. My next question is, what does serendipitously mean? Uh, it <laughs> this is supposed to be Is this like a spelling bee, S-E-R? Um, yeah. you, you know, what it means is, uh, if, you know, if you want to get down to the real basics, you, he, someone says, hey, there's an interesting person. You ought, to, you ought to think about writing an article for a newspaper yeah. about him. And you say, yeah, that would be an interesting article for a newspaper. And then a month later, a similar process happens. And before you know it, you've written three or four articles. Anyway, that question was heretical. But uh, the lead was uh, that serendipity comes from Arabic. That's really what I want to say. Yeah. It comes, well, I wasn't smart enough Arabic. to pick up yeah. on it. We should have prepped yeah. for this a little yeah. better. Yeah. Then right. I, mean, that's, I just wanted to say that, because it comes from serendib, which is actually Ceylon. But um, that's a heretical thing to add in this very serious discussion. Um, the next thing I'd like to ask you in connection with uh, the question I asked uh, just b before the serendipity was, uh, is, um, I mean, you do know a lot about the American Muslim community. Uh, you have been around. You've, been, you've talked with uh, hundreds of American Muslims, including myself. I, c I think we met in 2003. I think, two, I think at the, uh, in Chicago in 2004. Okay, at Labor Day. Uh, and yeah. Isna, right. Yeah. And um, I'd like to ask you, um, what would it mean to speak of an American Muslim mainstream? Is there such a thing? And, uh, so, and then, if there is a mainstream, do these people or any of them belong to that mainstream? And would that be significant? I mean, are they on the periphery or on the, are, so that's three questions. The mainstream, are they in the mainstream or the periphery, and how might that affect the picture? Um, you know, mainstream is a, is a shorthand term that, I mean, I guess many of us use in writing, particularly about current affairs. Mm -hmm. It's often very, very crude. I, I certainly use it. I don't know how many times I use the term in there, but I'm sure I do, even though yeah. I not something I thought about until you just asked this question. Um, I think it's a term that should be used with tremendous caution because I, I don't think there is necessarily, as I, as I said a minute ago, a, a, uh, a mainstream view that when you actually, that, that a significant majority of Muslims would necessarily subscribe to you. If you ask them about contemporary politics or you ask them about the best way to balance their commitments to their faith against their commitments to civil society, or you ask them about, uh, you know, how people should come together for marriage. I mean, mm -hmm. you would find a collection of views. You could probably, if you were a statistician, come up with a, a grouping someplace in the middle. Um, you, could, you could go to institutions that sponsor big conferences and call that the mainstream. Uh, and I would say that, uh, some but not all of these people certainly have strong attachments to the mainstream and certainly wouldn't, would see themselves as part of the mainstream in some general way. I mean, Siraj Wahaj is uh, an African-American imam and the uh, uh, story of African-American Islam really is fairly distinct from the story of uh, uh, immigrant uh, Muslims in this country. However, he's very unusual as an African-American mm -hmm. figure because he has been very deeply involved in 
uh, organizations uh, that are primarily dedicated to, to immigrant Muslims, and he is very well known among immigrant Muslims and has, has given sermons and lectures in, in many mosques all around the country, and I would say he's probably one of the best known Muslims in this country overall, if you took a poll. I would say that in some sense he's part of the mainstream Definitely. with all of the footnotes that I, mm -hmm. I, I noted. I mean, Osama Siblani is one of the most important Muslim political organizers in the country. Yeah. He happens to be almost entirely yeah. secular. Mm -hmm. He rarely sets foot inside a mosque mm -hmm. and yet considers himself to be a Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, so is he part of the mainstream? I would say not so much religiously, mm -hmm. but very much culturally, mm -hmm. socially, and and politically. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned the webmaster, who is a Saudi graduate student. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a guy who came to my attention because mm -hmm. he was criminally prosecuted for material support of terrorism for his role yes. in uh, tending to the website of an uh, Islamic group in Michigan mm -hmm. that uh, was both a proselytizing organization and also a, a disseminated literature of various sorts. And some of the literature was, that was put on the web uh, was uh, anti-Semitic in nature, anti-American, and uh, very, very contentious. The government said this amounted to inviting people to terrorism. In a fascinating trial, Al Hussein, this graduate student, was actually acquitted. A jury in Idaho basically said that the government hadn't shown that he had provided material support to terrorism. Now, is he in the mainstream? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sure that his activities in connection with that website would be considered in the mainstream. Yes. But on the other hand, as he presented himself, and I am sure as he saw himself, and I know as he was seen mm -hmm. at the University of Idaho, where he studied for a number of years, mm -hmm. after studying at several other American universities, he was absolutely the mainstream. He was the president of the MSA. Yeah. He was extremely popular on campus, and this <clears> is part of what made his story so paradoxical mm -hmm. and fascinating, in that he was seen by non-Muslims mm -hmm. in Moscow, Idaho, and at other places where he had studied as, as the outgoing Saudi, mm -hmm. the, the, the one who was comfortable talking to people of other faiths, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just je very popular. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, I mm -hmm. think he's in the vicinity of the mainstream. Now, some of the people I talk about, I would say, are not mainstream at all. Asra Nomani, the feminist, mm -hmm. who uh, caused a uh, huge controversy in her hometown mosque in Morgantown, West Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, after uh, announcing that she felt it was appropriate to pray in the main prayer hall with the men, not, not next to them and not in front of them, but behind them, as is normally dictated, it, as opposed to praying in the women's balcony, which was removed from the prayer hall in the back and uh, out of the line of sight of what was going on below. Out of this seemingly small confrontation grew a very large dispute that uh, divided the congregation in Morgantown, West Virginia, and then soon rippled out and caused a fair amount of controversy and interesting debate uh, all across the country, I would say. Mm -hmm. Now, she's not mainstream I, I, in the sense that she was the, a lightning rod, someone who, who, who yeah. sought out controversy. On the other hand, at that very same uh, ISNIC convention when we first met in uh, 2004, uh, Asra spoke on several panels at that mm -hmm. convention. And while she attracted a huge amount of hostility, mm -hmm including men coming up and lecturing her and pointing their finger at her and, you know, kind of un unappealing behavior. It was also clear that there were a large number of women at this convention. This is an organization called the Islamic Society of North America, which is the main body that conve convenes large uh, conferences uh, all across the country. It was clear that there were a lot of people who were quite interested, at least interested in her mm -hmm. message. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's my uh, overly long mm -hmm. answer. But I think, mm -hmm. to be fair to you, I don't want to be evasive. I think you were suggesting that my characters are not so mainstream. Um, well, I refuse to answer that question. But, um, <laughs> Good, I've talked you into submission, yeah, huh? Uh, that's, and, what I, and, that's what I tried and, to do. And certainly your answers are no longer than mine, and yours are much more direct. Um, I would just like to say the, the MSA is the Muslim Students Association. And um, most American universities and colleges have one. Um, you find Muslims in virtually every 
educational institution in the United States. And in fact, that's a really interesting and important point. People are always surprised. When they, there are Muslims in Morgantown, West Virginia, or mm -hmm. Moscow, Idaho, mm -hmm. and the reason they're there is because of proximity to the university. I mean, almost anywhere that there's a substantial yes. university, you will mm -hmm. find at least a small Muslim population, often not necessarily making a huge deal about themselves. Yes. But um, that was a, a revelation to me as I traveled around the country, yeah. how mm -hmm. dispersed Muslims actually now are. Now, um, one of the things that um, is very interesting about Islam in America is the fact that over the last 30 years it has become increasingly indigenous um, in the sense that um, you have people that have become very Americanized, at least in the way they speak and dress, but also you have a very large, probably 60% I would hold on the basis of certain statistics of American Muslims are now born in the United States. Some people would say much more than that. And the MSA is a very good example, a crucible of that, because when the MSAs began in the 1960s, um, they were overwhelmingly foreign students. And there'd be a you know, convert here and there, African American or white American. And then, as the decades went by, the um, Nate, the co composition of the MSAs changed fundamentally so that, for example, the case that you have in Idaho is, um, you find that in some universities. Um, the University of Illinois is, uh, uh, Indiana is somewhat like that, but most of the colleges and universities now, the MSAs are overwhelmingly Muslims who are born in this country. I find that very, very interesting. Yeah. And the MSAs change, they're, they're different. Uh, they, they differ from year to year, depending on the students that come in. No, that's but, very true. And, and, uh, and you know, the MSAs are, are very, very important institutions in the history of, of the religion Absolutely. and in this country. Many mosques in this yeah. country are essentially the outgrowth of mm -hmm. the, the MSA chapter that began in the 60s or the 70s. And uh, you, you, you see movement in different directions simultaneously. Mm -hmm. I would say the, the bulk of the movement is exactly as, as you described. Mm -hmm which is toward more leadership by American-born yes. uh, students, and a, uh, particularly in the last uh, mm -hmm. four or five years since 9-11, mm -hmm. a, a very self-conscious effort to reach out and engage and explain who, who they are and, and how they fit mm -hmm. in and so forth. There's a, a fascinating program that has moved all around the country, starting at, that, at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. Mustafa Saeed's story mm -hmm. takes place. Um, uh, where MSAs put on what they call fastathons, where they invite non-Muslims yes. to fast with them on Ramadan mm -hmm. as part of a larger fundraising act, mm -hmm. uh, ceremony. Uh, and they take the money that they raise and they give it not to Muslim causes, but to local mm -hmm. poverty and uh, hunger-related causes as a, a very self-conscious gesture to integrate yes. themselves in the community. It's an absolutely brilliant, from a point, PR yeah. point of view, and obviously, and it goes without saying, a very good uh, you know, mm. very good uh, charitable mm. work. At the same time, in certain places, the MSA mm. is actually a, uh, a, a very conservative force mm -hmm. in, in terms of religion and, and ideology. Mm -hmm. I'm not commenting on whether that's good or bad, mm -hmm. but, but rather than being a force for more integration is in fact mm -hmm. a, a force for more insularity. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the man, majority movement, mm -hmm. but you, I've encountered that um, a, in some places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point, and you know, I think that that also raises uh, an issue that comes up in the book, and that is the effect, especially on the activist Mustafa Saeed, who came from India to study engineering, right? Um, who uh, is very much affected by that environment, and I think one of the things that uh, would be important to note here is that overwhelmingly American Muslims, especially the children of immigrants. College is the first big formative period. It's when they really begin to look at Islam that they probably never took seriously or they may not have taken seriously before. And often the MSAs are conservative, as you say, and it affects them. But usually they come out of that, like Mustafa Saeed himself, um, in maybe the opposite uh, direction. So I think that's very interesting. But um, I think to get beyond this issue that I've really stressed a lot, probably too much, the issue of mainstream or periphery, um, you do mention uh, Wahhabism um, frequently in the book. 
uh, especially in the story of the scholar Khalid Abu al-Fadl at UCLA, who is well known for his very anti-Wahhabi stance. And what I'd like to ask you is that, um, do you feel that Wahhabism is the root cause of radicalism and of anything else that would make Islam dangerous in the United States or just incompatible? Okay, it's a, it's a very important and very good question, and, um, but the answer, of course, is a little complicated. Wahhab, by Wahhabism, we're referring to the distinctive uh, strain of the religion uh, associated particularly with the Persian Gulf and more narrowly with Saudi Arabia. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll risk uh, possibly offending a few people by just describing it kind, kind of bluntly. Um, I, I, I raise the possibility of offending people because, for example, many Saudis refuse to acknowledge the existence of Wahhabism. So if you, you bring it up, they're, they're immediately offended. Nothing, no, no such thing in the, exists. There aren't different strains of, it, strains of Islam. There is one true Islam. And anyone who says otherwise, you know, maybe a blasphemer or uh, doesn't know what they're talking about. I think many Muslims and certainly many non-Muslims see Wahhabism as a relatively intolerant, uh, uh, insular uh, approach to the religion. They have certain precepts that they follow. We don't have time here to go into the details, but they're uh, very impatient with and uh, generally reject other Muslims who view the religion differently or have had different experiences. And uh, it is used as a shorthand, and I use it at times as a shorthand, and I am happy to concede, not always with uh, scholarly precision, for uh, a perspective that is uh, uh, powerfully anti-Western uh, and uh, anti-assimilation uh, with secular society, and uh, given to a view of the world in terms of a, a, a clash between Islam and, and non-Islam. Uh, I don't think it is the sole source of radicalism, not at all. There are many other movements. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole body of thought that flows from the Muslim Brotherhood and the, a more modernist uh, highly politicized Islam. Many Wahhabis are actually not that political. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but I do think that mm -hmm. these strains have come together in this country as they've come together elsewhere mm -hmm. and are a source of need, are definitely a source of concern. And they, they take several forms. I mean, and I think most Muslims in this country are familiar with those forms. In many mosques, uh, the literature will even if the mosque is, is a relatively uh, you know, modern institution, the literature, if it's come from Saudi Arabia, will have footnotes or language inserted in brackets that tends to nudge the mm -hmm. writing, whether it's the Quran itself mm -hmm. or Hadith or other writing, mm -hmm. in a kind of belligerent, bellicose, mm -hmm. uh, us versus them, versus them mm -hmm. the believers versus the infidels mm -hmm. uh, direction. And while someone who believes that stuff doesn't, it doesn't mean that they're violent, it doesn't, let alone that they're terrorists, they're going to do, do something tomorrow, mm -hmm. it, to, it's, I think it's a troubling ideology. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd just like to add uh, a, f what, a footnote of my own, um, which Paul may or may not accept, but um, you know, Wahhabism is an extremely exclusivist interpretation of the faith. I know that you accept that because you said so. Right. Um, however, I would like to emphasize that from its inception in the late 18th century, Wahhabism has been fundamentally directed towards the Muslim community. Right. And consequently, in the United States and elsewhere, um, even in countries like Albania and Bosnia, um, it really destroys the Muslim community. It breaks up the Muslim community. And um, I would, however, like to uh, you know, return again to the question, is it the root cause of extremism, of um, potential terrorism? Well, I mean, as I explained in the book, I mean, you know, a, a, a label that's, that, that describes a collection of thoughts, whether they are a collection of theological thoughts or 
ideological thoughts or a, a swirling together of the, of the, the two. I mean, I'm not sure you'd call, you'd call the thoughts themselves the root cause. I mean, the, you know, since the 1970s, there's been a surge of uh, fundamentalism and radicalism within Islam, not, not just in this country, but everywhere. Fascinating coincidence with the surge in fundamentalism in this country within Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, totally different causes, two movements occurring at precisely the same time. In fact, it's a third movement. You actually see fundamentalism within Judaism surging in Israel in the 1970s <clears throat> when the no notion of the West Bank being, uh, you know, biblically granted to the Jews suddenly became a central aspect of, mm -hmm. of Israeli politics when it hadn't been before. I, I'm not enough of a scholar to know what to make of that coincidence, but it, it mm -hmm. certainly is amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, I think the fallout from the uh, fundamentalist revivalism that has stirred throughout the predominantly Muslim world and has lapped over onto our shores as well mm -hmm is the root cause of radicalism here. And mm -hmm. you, you need to fully understand it, you need to understand mm -hmm. the 1979 revolution in mm -hmm. Iran mm -hmm. and the reaction to that uh, mm -hmm. by the Sunni Saudis who became mm -hmm. worried that uh, suddenly the Shia Iranians were gonna become mm -hmm. dominant in, in the mm -hmm. Middle East. So they stepped up their proselytizing mm -hmm. activities, mosque building, literature distribution, mm -hmm. training of clergy and so forth, all of those activities together, I think, have had an effect here. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a big, a very hot debate over the degree of that effect. Mm -hmm. There are Muslims, like Professor Abu al who will mm -hmm. tell you it's a tremendous danger. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there are other Muslims who, perhaps because they don't want to have dirty laundry ha hung out in public, will, will completely play it down. Mm -hmm. The latter, I think, is not a very credible mm -hmm position. And then there are Muslims mm -hmm. who are in some place in the middle who will debate over, well, mm -hmm. it's kind of a problem. I certainly wouldn't want it in my mosque. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to make too big a deal mm -hmm. over it. Um, if you mm -hmm. tour around, these, the, my view of <clears throat> the American Muslim experience is that the, the main theme is one of tremendous success, as mm -hmm. material success, as you mm -hmm. were describing, educational success, mm -hmm. success in assimilating into American mm -hmm. society, whether, whether Muslims are secular or very devout. Mm -hmm a huge majority have been successful in adjusting mm -hmm. to life here, mm -hmm. even after 9-11. Mm -hmm. But there's a small sub-theme mm -hmm. connected, I think, mm -hmm. to ideas that mm -hmm. in the wrong mm -hmm. framework, mm -hmm. when they're attached to notions mm -hmm. of a global Muslim grievance, the notion that Muslims are afflicted everywhere and mm -hmm. at all times mm -hmm. by non-Muslims, mm -hmm. you wrap that together with fundamentalist religious mm -hmm. views mm -hmm. and radical political ideology, and you mm -hmm. have the danger that in a certain person's mind, you'll get what I think of as a kind of utopian aspiration, mm -hmm. a romantic notion that with one dramatic gesture, mm -hmm. we're gonna solve all these problems, mm -hmm. reassert Muslim mm -hmm. identity, mm -hmm. and yeah. vanquish our foes. And mm -hmm. if you get someone thinking along those lines, mm -hmm. in today's world, with the mm -hmm. conflicts we have in, in the predominantly Muslim world, that's mm -hmm. a potential danger zone, I think. Well. Uh, here at the University of Chicago, uh, Martin Marty, who is um, at the Divinity School and, of course, is famous around the world for his works uh, on religion and who also directed the Fundamentalist Project, the Fundamentalism Project, um, he shows that you have fundamentalism in Christianity, of course, the radical, the right. evangelicals, um, the Christian right, uh, you have it in Judaism. Um, and I want to emphasize again, I mean, something that's is lost on, I think, many non-Muslim Americans. Saying someone is a fundamentalist Muslim mm -hmm. is, doesn't mean at all that that person mm -hmm. is prone toward violence. It's, yeah. it's no more than saying someone is mm -hmm. a Pentecostal mm -hmm. would mean that that person yeah. would burn someone's house down to forward their Pentecostal views. We're right. talking about people mm -hmm. who, you know, who have a, a literalist approach, who, yes. who, who make a sharp distinction between the believers yes. and the non-believers in the sense that certain people, you know, we're, yeah. going, we're going to heaven, they're all going right. to hell, those kinds of beliefs. That does not mean right. you're, you're, you're lighting a bomb anytime soon. That's right. And, and so you have Christians, Jews, Hindus, Muslims, uh, you know, and fundamentalism is remarkably similar uh, in all those communities. Um, but one of the points that the Fundamentalism Project makes is that there are social or sociological causes um, that feed into that fundamentalism and is actually the perception of that, you know, which the fundamentalism is a reaction to. So this brings back the issue of, well, 
I would like to say it's the chicken and the egg that um, George Lakoff wrote recently, Don't Think of an Elephant, which I know that a lot of you know, uh, which is an excellent work uh, for the Democratic Party that really needs some help. And it's basically on cognitive frames. And one of the things that Lakoff shows is that the cognitive frames that people have um, are really the essential issue, even in their political orientation. So if you control the cognitive frame, you basically control everything. And so my point here is that, you know, when you have a cognitive frame, then if you don't change that frame, the facts will bounce off. And therefore, um, you know, what if there are other root causes? Uh, for example, you do speak a lot about the Arab-Israeli conflict. Oh, yeah. You do speak a lot about anti-Semitism, um, the rhetoric of which we hear a lot in the Muslim community. But is it not possible that you underplay uh, these issues, like, uh, you know, the Arab-Israeli crisis, um, you know, what happened in Bosnia and Chechnya, um, Afghanistan, you know, the many grievances of the Muslim world, such as political tyranny in the Muslim world, because uh, these are experiences which definitely affect the cognitive frames of Muslims. And therefore, would it not be the case then that if we do not address these root causes, that to talk about an ideology like Wahhabism in a way becomes um, it, well, it's not really hitting the nail on the head because we have to also ask, why are they receptive to that? You know, and uh, so I think, again, um, what about these other issues, like the Arab-Israeli crisis? Yeah. Well, I, dis I discuss uh, you know, mm -hmm. the Arab-Israeli crisis uh, in most, if not all, the chapters. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I have several thoughts. One, while I was stressing earlier that uh, American Muslims are not at all monolithic, and there isn't necessarily an Islamic position on any question. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the closest you could get to a consensus mm -hmm. on, on, a, on a pressing issue of, of the day would be on the Arab-Israeli conflict. I mean, the huge majority of Muslims have tremendous antipathy toward Israel and tremendous sympathy toward the Palestinians and other Arabs who clashed with it, Israel. And absolutely, that... Uh, that uh, bloody confrontation, and more specifically, American support for Israel, and what is seen as lockstep American support for Israel, unthinking American support for Israel, is a source of tremendous frustration um, to Muslims in this country, to varying degrees, much more so, for example, if you have to be, speak about it roughly to people of Arab descent than people of South Asian descent. There are some people from India and Pakistan for, for whom that's a much more distant, less immediate issue. Um, and I guess I would uh, agree with you that, that frustration over that is, a, uh, is, is an ingredient uh, in alien, a sense of alienation. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I would take a step further, and now I'm not really talking about my book, but more kind of in a, you know, a debating mode, mm -hmm. which is that, and, I, and I, I do this with some hesitation since I don't generally like to do this, but I guess I would, I would argue that um, in this country, people actually should strive to struggle over uh, ideological views, um, religious views, and sorting these things out without waiting for or expecting uh, intractable conflicts mm -hmm. six and 9,000 miles away mm -hmm. to be sorted out, mm -hmm. because they may never be sorted out, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. certainly not in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. And yet I think it is possible for Americans of different faiths, mm -hmm. it is possible to, mm -hmm. to agree to disagree passionately on certain things, mm -hmm and yet have a lot more to do with each other. I think, yeah. for example, Jews and Muslims in this country mm -hmm. will have to learn somehow mm -hmm. to have a, more of a conversation, mm -hmm. setting Israel and Palestinians to one side and having mm -hmm. conversations about some things in this mm -hmm. country in order to learn how to trust mm -hmm. each other more. Mm -hmm. Right now, you know, there's, there's barely any mm -hmm. civil conversation. Mm -hmm. And if, if they wait around mm -hmm. for a, a resolution of the fate mm -hmm. of, of Palestinians that will satisfy Muslims, mm -hmm. I mean, right. They need to start talking about other things. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I mean, even though we've sort of departed from the issue that we'll come back to, which is the book, but um, I, I, I myself feel that one of the greatest uh, 
misfortunes for the American Muslim community is this alienation from the Jewish community, which in my belief um, should be its natural ally and historically would have been because the two communities are very similar and uh, you know they really uh, there are so many other issues that they you know, can work on, and you know, especially the peace movements in both camps. But um, I wrote a, an op-ed piece for the LA Times that uh, ran on Monday called um, Reporting on Muslims While Jewish. Mm -hmm. yeah. Jewish was me. <laughs> um, and one of the observations I made was while I, I certainly encountered a fair amount of anti-Semitism among mm -hmm. Muslims, mm -hmm. the proportion of anti-Semitism in, in, in my rough experience more or less matched what I could the reflexive mm -hmm. hatred of Muslims and Arabs that I found among Jews. And that I often encountered Muslim families who reminded me considerably of my own family yes. in terms of their mm -hmm. uh, obsession about education, mm -hmm. about the next generation outdoing mm -hmm. the last generation, and about you know, the eating. Mm -hmm. You're like, not allowed to leave the table. No, eat more, no, eat more, right. more. Um, just to pitch from my own book again, um, one of the interesting things about the Webb story, which happens, of course, back in the 1890s, is uh, the very positive relation that he had with Jews and that Jews had with him, especially uh, Rabbi Herschel, who was one of the leading uh, you know, reformed Jewish intellectuals and uh, who really had a very positive rapport with Webb, especially at the uh, World's Parliament of Religions here in Chicago. And by the way, most of the fair, you know, especially the Ottomans and the Moroccans and so forth, and they had a mosque, was right out here in the Midway, Midway Plaisance. And there's some pictures of that. My book does have pictures, by the way. Um, you know what we should do? We should see if anyone uh, has any questions. Yeah, we should audience. do that. We should do that. Does anyone have Can any I questions? ask one last question? Sure. Yeah, and that is that, you know, I notice in, um, Almost every, uh, well, I think in every instance, perhaps but one, um, there's a big question mark that is put uh, behind each of the, the seven groups. Uh, sometimes because they seem to be very good themselves but have no response in the Muslim community, and in other cases because they're in the community but they're radical. Um, tell me about those question marks, and then um, I'd like you to just close up by um, your idea of what kind of an overall impression, impression uh, an American reader would be likely to have of this book. Okay, I'm, I'm afraid that the, the, the latter I can answer, but I wasn't following the question mark. Question. Yeah, uh, in other words, um, you know, if we look at someone like Dr. Uh, Khalid Abul Fadl, right. the big question mark is, yeah, but he, nobody listens to him. I, I think that's incorrect. Okay. I mean, just, just to use one example, I, I think that he is, mm -hmm. uh, has had a tremendous influence um, on younger mu Muslims, uh, primarily Muslims who are at the, at the moment would be 40 and younger, mm -hmm. um, including many who may not um, uh, see him as a model in terms of a, at a, on a personal level. But the several books and many articles he's written, I think, um, have served as a catalyst for discussion. Mm -hmm. And have um, that's true. Done exactly done mm -hmm. done what he advocates in it, but in in an indirect way. One of his big missions is to reintroduce the ferment and the debate mm -hmm. and the disputation mm -hmm. about what the religion means that was so prevalent uh, in the you know Islamic heyday mm -hmm. of, of the medieval mm -hmm. era when when beyond dis beyond dispute, it, it, it Islam mm -hmm. was intellectually dominant in much of the world. Mm -hmm. And he wants to remind people of that and, and, and excavate that and, and put it in front of people and say, and essentially, the same could be true today. Mm -hmm. We have to open our minds. Mm -hmm. Now, there may be people who, who have objections about how he has gone about that and mm -hmm. his personality. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think there is a lot more debate, particularly in and around college campuses, mm -hmm as a result of those books being published, even though those books are not popular in the general. That's very true. Uh, in, in the general. So this, I think, is an illustration. I mean, journalists can, can be uh, justifiably criticized sometimes for picking out people in the midst of controversy. Why do, why do the damn media always write about conflict? I mean, you're, you're mm -hmm. so negative. That is often true. However, conflict and people who create friction 
frequent, the, the, the sparks from the friction frequently illuminate. They illuminate more than the person that you start with. Mm -hmm. They can illuminate a broader situation. Mm -hmm. And that is the method here. I okay. don't think Asra Nomani is a typical yes. Muslim woman. She's an extraordinary Muslim mm -hmm. woman. She's extraordinarily eloquent. She's extraordinarily uh, uh, energetic. Um, you might think that she's extraordinarily eccentric. Mm -hmm. Why would someone put themselves mm -hmm. in, out for so, to absorb so much criticism? Yes. No ordinary person would do that. Mm -hmm. But all the argument around her illuminates the question of women's place in the religion, mm -hmm. both in the mm -hmm. literal sense of where they sit mm -hmm. and the more figurative sense and yes. so forth. So that's my, I apologize, that's my mm -hmm. slightly argumentative um, uh, response. And the second part of the question was? The American impression. Yeah. Um, well, all I can do, I guess, is tell you what my goal was and what the, the tiny fragments of reaction I picked up, you know, anecdotally while yes. uh, touring to promote the book and talking to people. Uh, the goal was simply to open people's minds, mm -hmm. to, to show people that there's a discrepancy between mm -hmm. um, what they know and what the reality is, mm -hmm. and here's a beginning, here's a start to bridge that discrepancy. Okay. I don't, you know, this is not, shouldn't be the last book written on this subject, mm -hmm. um, but I think, uh, I even think, I think you said this appropriately in your opening remark, that it's a, it's, it might, might be for many people a first step in that direction. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's the journalist's version. Yes. It, it's, it's the version of someone who goes out mm. into the world with a pad and pen and a tape recorder and talks to people and then comes back mm -hmm. and says, all right, now let me try to boil down what that guy's all about. Mm -hmm. If you think that's of use, then mm -hmm. the book is of use. Mm -hmm. If you need footnotes, mm -hmm. you come to the wrong guy. Well, I'd like to conclude before we open up, you know, with questions that I, I end where I began, that this is a very good book. Um, it's very wonderfully written. Uh, it's easy to read. It's a human interest. And um, it is a very good uh, key into the American Muslim community. And uh, I recommend it very strongly. That's very and kind thank of you, Paul. Thank you.